Yeah. Uh, allow me to uh, take this opportunity uh, to welcome you uh, to Mbale City and also take this opportunity uh, to thank the Bank of Uganda for choosing Mbale City as the priority uh, for this day. I, I, I want to send uh, the sincere regards uh, from His Worship, the Mayor of Mbale City, who has not been able to be with us due to other uh, busy schedules, uh, but nevertheless, he has sent you greetings, and he has said that whatever we're going to discuss here be a blessing uh, to the development of Uganda and Mbali City as a whole. Uh, I'm happy uh, that today we are addressing issues uh, which affects our people, uh, more especially uh, concerning the economy of Uganda. Uh, Papa Deputy Governor, we as people of Mbale City, Mbale District, and Uganda as a whole, uh, we have uh, got a lot of uh, challenges uh, in the field of the banks. And this one, I will not hesitate, I, I really want to represent my people every and put across the challenges which our staffs are facing uh, in the field of the banks. One, uh, I want to talk about the, the staffs. People have got loans within the microfinance banks, and of which, uh, when I interacted mostly with uh, Jonah, he was telling me that uh, most of the banks, Bank of Uganda, doesn't recognize them. And uh, to me, I was wondering where do those small banks get permission to operate within our locality? One, we have Uganda Bankers Association. That is an association of the bankers within the small microfinances. And you get that uh, you wake up in the morning, you've got a small loan, you get a code on your salary. They've put a code. And when that code is on your salary, in most cases, someone pays, finishes that loan, but at the end of the day, they don't remove the code. Uh, more people are suffering with that. Am I lying, colleagues? We don't know where the codes come from, but you just see that is UBA, Uganda Bankers Association. And also want to know, who is that person responsible for that code? And if you're working in an organization, whom do they talk with? Minus uh, a staff having permission to know that the code is on my salary. That one is one, the first challenge. I also have another challenge of money lenders. The, most of the money lenders have mushroomed the world, wherever, everywhere uh, in this Mbale state, in the district, and let me say, in the whole of this Uganda. The money lenders are charging 30% interest to our people. People are not having IDs. They have kept for them IDs. And as you know, ID is the property of Uganda. Perhaps you want to do something and need an ID. People don't have an ID because of poverty and because of the money lenders. We have these ones who are resembling, they're just the same, they're called Obama Nyankole, I don't know something of the sort. There are very many that are punishing our people. Once they give them money, they even cane them. They move with sticks and they're caning them. So we want to know. The 30% they charge our people. Where are they getting permission to charge the 30%? percent on money lending. Our people are suffering. Teachers are not teaching because of the loans. The loans are too high. We want to know so that from our deputy governor. Uh, 
on another, on another side, I want to thank you uh, for supporting our, our farmers. But one challenge is our farmers, once they want to get a small loan uh, to, uh, in, in the field of agriculture, someone wants one million, that one, the procedures are too long. They cannot access that little money to help them run their agricultural businesses on the small scale. Instead, uh, most of the banks want people who are applying for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. That one, they work on them very fast. So I don't know if that one uh, would be addressed. Then also our low, small income earners would also be able to access that loan for the agriculture. And then uh, we also had uh, a loan which, were, which was given to the business enterprises. That loan was given in the time of COVID, when uh, people recovered from COVID. They had a small loan which was being given to them to sustain their businesses so that they are not able to close their businesses. So with that, I want, I, I want to, uh, to request to you, uh, Deputy Governor, that uh, since COVID has reduced, uh, why can't we open up uh, that uh, small loan business so that you can give, uh, it can be open to the public to also access that money to sustain the small enterprises within our city uh, district so that people are able uh, to also perhaps earn a living. So uh, with those few remarks, uh, I want uh, to really appreciate you, our Deputy Governor, uh, for coming to Mbale City, Mbale District, uh, to address people on issues concerning the economy. So on that note, I want to um, wish everyone of us here a good deliberation it's for God and my country. Thank you very much um, for those wonderful remarks and for the hints towards the discussion. Um, it's now time to introduce to you the, the remaining person who is the Deputy Governor of Bank of Uganda, uh, Mr. Michael Ating Ego. And therefore, I also take the honor to invite you to come and speak to us. Um, look, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I was once told that when you're in Rome, you, became, you have to behave like the Romans, so that now I'm in Mbali, I have to say, Mulembe ba papa, ni ba mai. Okay? But let me first of all say, I'm observing all the protocol, as it was earlier uh, mentioned, so I'm not going to go through it. And I really want to thank the uh, Deputy Mayor, she Harriet. I think you have hit the nail on the head. And before I make my remarks, I just want to confirm that we have a representative of UBA here. Is Patricia here? Patricia, oh, I, I, I'm glad you're around. You've had the concerns raised by Harriet. And then there's a representative of Umra. I think I had breakfast with you. Are you here? Yes. So you need to answer the questions that have been raised by, by Harriet. And then, of course, I have my own staff who are going to talk to the issue of uh, loans to agriculture and the small businesses and I am uh, aware that there are a number of commercial banks represented here 
at least when I was living in Kampala yesterday, I talked to the MD of Centenary Bank, the regional manager and the branch manager. Can you confirm that you're here? Yes, and I have a number of other commercial banks that are represented in Bali. You've had the issues that have been raised by the mayor. So I'm going to ask you to respond to these issues because these are pertinent issues that are affecting the people. So, Deputy Mayor, they are going to respond to these issues since they are the ones who deal with you. On that note, let me make my few remarks. Um, first, uh, on behalf of Bank of Uganda, I really, really want to thank the people of Mbale, particularly the leaders and the residents of uh, Mbale and then Bugisu as a sub-region for the very, very warm welcome that you have given the participants to this meeting today, and more especially the Bank of Uganda staff who have been interacting with you for some time now, and also for the welcome that you gave me and the delegation that came yesterday. So I really want to thank you for, particularly those who joined us yesterday and are still with us. It really shows the commitment that you have. You want to understand what is this central bank that we are talking about. Some of you are saying that it is so difficult to get to Bank of Uganda. That's why you have said, okay, fine. If it's difficult to come to Bank of Uganda, we are going to come to you. Right? So that's why we're here. And to understand the role of the Bank of Uganda and also to, to, to discuss with you the approaches that you have in mind in as regards as fulfilling our mandate. We see that the town hall meetings are very, very vital in as far as Bank of Uganda is concerned, particularly in engaging with our stakeholders about the role of the central bank, its work, and its impact, and addressing the, all the queries that you have about Bank of Uganda and the activities that are engaging uh, us and you. Uh, so we want to get your valuable feedback. Because sometimes we can be hanging in Kampala there, thinking that everything is okay, but we want to come to you and ask you, do you really feel the impact of Bank of Uganda? And how do you feel the impact of Bank of Uganda? You can feel the impact of Bank of Uganda if you know what Bank of Uganda is supposed to be doing. So that's why we're here, seeking a feedback from you. Um, there was a lady uh, some time back, she, is called, she was called Mary Therese Winifred Robinson. She was the first female president of the Republic of Ireland. She had these wise words, quote, to make progress, we have to build a multi-stakeholder process, harnessing the appropriate energies. Those words are very, very powerful. So for us in Bank of Uganda, we believe that a multi-stakeholder solution leveraging on diverse perspectives and a collective energy of individuals and groups are very important in driving progress. That's why we're here to interact with you. You are our stakeholders. You are the public that we are supposed to serve. We exist to serve the people of Uganda. So I want to hear, what do the people of Uganda think about us? So please be very, very candid to us. Tell us exactly where we want, where we should do right, where we should do better. Once we have explained to you what our mandate is. Do you see any shortcomings? We therefore feel that your questions, your comments, your opinions are very, very essential in improving our performance in serving all the Ugandans. And so, we are here, very, very eager, to engage in an open and a candid discussion about Bank of Uganda with the people of Mbale and Bugisu sub-region today. Also, there was another gentleman who was called James Queen, an American public administration authority who once said, quote, 
agencies differ in two main respects. Can the activities of their operators be observed? Can you observe our activities? And can the results of those activities be observed? So are you seeing our results? Or we are just talking to ourselves? When we say inflation has come down to 2.4% for headline, 2% for core, are you asking yourself, these guys, what are they smoking? Don't, don't they know that prices are going up? So let's have a discussion on this today. So at the Bank of Uganda, we approach these questions with transparency and accountability as we carry our mandate. Transparently communicating as a central bank governance, policies, outcomes, and official relations, it fosters clarity, it does reduce uncertainty, and improves policy outcomes. We want you to be certain. We don't want you to, to, to keep second guessing us that those guys, you know, they are there in their suits and their ties. They don't know what we are going through. And that's why we've come today to you, really, as ordinary people, dressed in our t-shirts, trying to identify with you so that you are free to talk to us without any fear or any favor. So we believe that this approach aims to secure public support, preserve operational independence, and enhance policy effectiveness. Once we have this kind of discussion, this is what is going to generate this. So, of course, we do recognize that central bank independence hinges on transparency. Because if you are independent, you have to be transparent. You have to be transparent. Otherwise, your independence will be called into question. So we need to emphasize the importance of ensuring public understanding of our policies and actions. So the public must understand what our policies are, what our actions are, what do we do, why do we pursue the policies that we pursue. You need to understand us so that if you are going to judge us, you judge us from that aspect there. So we are pleased to know that Bank of Uganda, again, this one, I, I, I'm going to have to say it. Bank of Uganda stands out among the select central banks in the world that have been reviewed under the new Central Bank Transparency Code by the International Monetary Fund. At the time when Bank of Uganda was undertaking this review, we were the seventh central bank in the whole world. There were about 168 or so central banks, but we were the seventh to undertake transparency. So what, what does this mean? It means that the IMF findings praise the Bank of Uganda's communication policy and strategy recognizing our commitment to transparent communication and active public engagement. And that's why we're here. We are engaging the public. We want to find out from you what can we do better. That is the aspect of transparency. We don't fear to be criticized. If you see that Bank of Uganda is not doing what is right, tell us, and then we can have a dialogue. This is not a monologue. I'm not preaching to you. We are here to listen to you. We are presenting our side of the story. We want to hear from you. Where could we have done better? Do you think that inflation is too low? Do you think that money is too, so tight? Do you think that we should print more money? Let's have a discussion so that we, get to, we tell you the pros and the cons of each of these. So briefly, let me provide an overview of the Bank of Uganda's work just to set the stage for the open discussion. Our mission centers on ensuring price stability. That's the first and the first most thing, price stability. And a robust financial system that aligns with Uganda's socioeconomic transformation as aligned or as outlined in Vision 2040. 
Initially, prior to 2022, our mission statement used to read to promote price stability and a sound financial sector. But last year, when we were revising our strategic plan, because it's a five-year plan, so the last five years ended in 2022. So now we are in the next strategic plan, running from 2022 to 2027. We ask ourselves the question, to promote price stability and a sound financial sector, so what? This is a question we ask ourselves. How can we become more relevant to the people? What is the government agenda in terms of development? What is the narrative right now? The narrative right now is social economic transformation. So we need to be speaking to the people. So we therefore amended our mission statement to read, to support or to promote price stability and support a sound financial sector in support of social economic transformation. So most of the initiatives that we are undertaking in the five years starting from 2022 are really in support of social economic transformation. Bank of Uganda on its own cannot achieve social economic transformation. So we are playing our role. That's why we are using the word in support. So there's what we can contribute towards supporting social economic transformation. And that's what we are going to be discussing with you earlier, I mean, later on. And we want to hear from you. Do you think we are doing the right thing? So. Fundamentally, our mission resembles a three-legged stool that is supported by key pillars. That is to ensure price stability, overseeing the safety and the soundness of the financial institutions, and of course, managing the payment system. Now, the payment system is very, very critical, particularly when it comes to socioeconomic transformation, as we shall see later on. So a core responsibility is to uphold and enhance the stability of the Uganda shilling value. We strive to protect the purchasing power of money, aiming for consistency in the prices of vital commodities such as maize meal or school fees. I think you, you all remember that last year we were faced with serious challenges of inflation. We are coming from COVID-19 in 2021. So as we were reopening the economy, uh, you recall that in early January, the president announced that we are going to open the schools. So when schools were opened, but because the economy had been locked down, most of the factories that were producing scholastic materials had also been locked down. Now, the announcement that we are opening schools meant that the demand for scholastic materials kind of like shot up. But the supply of scholastic materials did not respond as fast. So what happened? The price of scholastic materials and other educational related activities kind of like went because the demand was outstripping supply. So we saw a slight increase in inflation as a result of the education services sector. But that was contained. Inflation went to about 2.7 overall in January last year. And then, of course, you know, when one country woke up one morning and decided to invade their neighbors, it had a ripple effect the rest of the economy. The prices of fuel went up. The prices of soap went up. Prices of wheat went up all the oil-related products went up. So we began to see inflation. A bar of soap reached about 12,000 shillings from, from, from about, about 3,000. We saw the price of fuel products, take for example, super petrol, rise from about 3,800 per liter in February, closing to nearly 6,700 shillings by the time we were in August. And were not helped by the fact that we had an extended drought last year. You all remember that the drought last year was extended. 
food crop inflation went up. So as a result, the entire inflationary environment picked up. So inflation that was at 2.7% in uh, January 2022 hit 10.7% 10 in October 2022. And there were cries from the public that something needs to be done. But that was the responsibility of the central bank. So we, we did whatever it took to ensure that this inflation does not continue rising. Because if inflation were to rise and it becomes entrenched, it becomes difficult to bring it down, it becomes more expensive, and it takes a much longer time to bring it down. So the central bank had to act very, very fast. And that's why today we are able to have inflation of 2.4% of headline and 2% Core. By core, I mean you strip off food crop prices, you strip off things like fuel and energy because those are volatile, they are not in our control. But the ones that are in our control, we brought it down to 2%. Our target is 5%. So, when we talk about preserving the value of the Uganda shilling, we are trying to preserve the value of the, the Uganda shilling by making sure that inflation does not erode the value your purchasing power. By saying that inflation has come down to 2%, it doesn't mean to say that prices have come down. Yes, some prices have come down, but on average, the rate at which prices are increasing has slowed down from 10.7% last year. They are now only increasing on average by 2%. It is our target that inflation increases by 5% per annum in order to encourage businesses. Also, another aspect of preserving the value of the shilling is by making sure that the exchange rate is stable. We've had challenges with the exchange rate. It is difficult to get external financing. We've had so many shocks, which I cannot get into. But overall, the Ugandan exchange rate has been fairly stable. You need to look around the neighborhoods and see what's happened to the exchange rate in the neighborhoods. And then maybe you will appreciate why we are saying that our exchange rate is a bit stable. So when you talk about enhancing price stability to ensure the value of the Uganda shilling is preserved, this is exactly what we are talking about. So price stability enables individuals to plan and to sustain their living standards. There's no point of you waking up today that a meal of kawunga and beans is 5,000 shillings today. The following month is 10,000. The other day is 40,000. It becomes difficult for you to plan, particularly when your salary is not rising, is not increasing. It means that the purchasing power of your available income is being eroded by the rising prices. It means that you're eating less and less because inflation is coming, uh, is, you know, is going up. So we are here to ensure that price stability ensures that individual plants are, are maintained and people sustain their living standards. And of course also we oversee the licensing and regulations uh, of the supervised financial institutions and this includes include commercial banks, credit institutions, and micro-deposit-taking institutions. We have to ensure their safe operations. We have to ensure that they foster customer trust. And this is why the Deputy Mayor Harriet was raising this issue, customer trust. Are the issues that she raised, are those issues building customer trust? So that's where we, have, we are going to have a discussion and that these financial institutions also uphold ethical business standards. So we aim to, uh, to, to curb financial crimes, enforce consumer protection, encourage the treatment of customers by the financial institutions in a fair way, in a fair way, so that once you make a deposit, 
you were able to go and withdraw the deposit. Once you get a loan and you are paying according to schedule, nobody is grabbing your land title. Once you are in the bank, you don't have to spend a long time queuing in the bank. So we are saying that we want to encourage fair treatment of customers by the financial institution. So if there is anything that seems to suggest that you are not getting fair treatment from the financial institutions, I think this is the time to raise it because we have here commercial banks, microfinance institutions represented, and they will explain to you why this is the case. Now, the Bank of Uganda supervises the banking sector, ensuring that only adequately capitalized and professionally managed banks obtain and sustain uh, operating licenses. It will be very, very unfortunate for you if you woke up this morning and you walk to your branch expecting to make a withdrawal and then you find a very big placard there written, closed. How do you like that? It, it's not good. So what Bank of Uganda does is to ensure that you don't find the placard closed. You need to go and find those doors open. And it takes a lot of work by Bank of Uganda and the supervised financial institutions to ensure that, that those doors are open every day and that you are able to conduct your business on a daily basis. In instances of failure, we prioritize safeguarding depositors' funds and stability of other financial entities. Our commitment lies in enhancing the management of failed financial institutions for accountability and to protect the interests of all stakeholders. Today, we are honored here to have the ED of the Deposits Protection Fund. The ED of the Deposits Protection Fund is dealing with those institutions that have been moved from ICU. And are they headed for the mortuary? <laughs> I don't know. You will tell us. So how do you deal with those, ED, with those institutions that have been rolled to the mortuary, particularly if they owe people some money? All right. So, so in other words, the Bank of Uganda is responsible for ensuring the safety and the stability of the country's payment system, including the growing reliance on mobile money transactions. I think, colleagues, you will all agree with me that mobile money transactions are growing by leaps and bounds. Who of you doesn't have a mobile money account? I think you're, you all have mobile money accounts, okay? And that has grown by leaps and bounds. So, the surge in mobile money usage, notably started during the COVID-19 pandemic, but has expanded uh, in terms of financial access and more people countrywide have now embraced it. However, we want to stress the importance of the use of caution due to associated risks like fraud and cyber threats. There are people out there who are not sleeping. As you sleep, they are thinking, how can I hack into your mobile money account? How can I pretend to be you and go and get your money? So, we have enhanced what we call literacy outreaches to educate people on how they can protect their mobile money. You see, there's a saying that a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. We can do all the financial literacy on cyber fraud and what to do. But if you keep on giving your pin to your son who is in high school, who loves money, you give your pin to your son, that money is going to be swept from your phone. So in other words, we encourage all of you to be part and parcel of the fight against cyber fraud. By you playing your own part, keeping your phone very diligently, keeping your pin 
not sharing your opinion, not writing it down anywhere where it can be seen. Right? And trying to learn more of yourself how to further protect your resources. It doesn't take you just to, to learn more. I think we are trying to, to go, to use all the available languages in Uganda to address the issue of cyber fraud. So try to listen to those programs to see how you can secure your own finances. And in that way, we are all making the system stronger and uh, safer. So we are actively uh, promoting digital financial literacy, and the aim is to shield users from IT and cybersecurity risk. We urge collaboration among stakeholders to mitigate IT threats and cybersecurity risks, enhancing the resilience and effectiveness of electronic financial services. Because we believe that secure and efficient electronic financial services allows us to decrease the dependence on fiscal currency notes and coins, which entails substantial production, transportation, and security costs. So for example, if I sent you money in your wallet, you've gotten 100,000 or maybe 200,000. And you are going to Nakaloke market. It's a market day in Nakaloke. And you want to buy a bunch of matoke. It is almost Christmas. You want to buy a bunch of matoke. You want to buy a chicken. You want to buy tomatoes. And the guy who's selling, this is a, oh, fine. Your bill is 100,000. I think the first question you should ask this guy is, do you have mobile money? If he says yes, ask him, can I transfer it to you? I don't think you'll refuse. So if you transfer that mobile money to that person sending it, he will accept. All right? And if you have about six or seven customers doing the same thing, this guy who's selling my chicken might be having a child who's going to senior two in Nabumali High School. All right? So the first thing he asks the headmaster, how much is the fees? The headmaster says, oh, because of the increased cost of being business, we've raised the school fees from 400 to 500,000. I think you also should ask the headmaster, do you have mobile money where I can send the money? I'm sure that school has got mobile money account. Then you transfer it. So if we all did that, shall we need cash? Shall we need cash? No, we will not need cash. And the cost of printing cash is very, very expensive. Very expensive. So that means Bank of Uganda will reduce on the amount of money that it's using on printing cash. And it can save more money. Then we can have a discussion that we last opened Nakaloke Health Force Center three years ago. So maybe we should now think of another health center since we have saved money. So the discussion is, which health center now in Bali? That's for the leadership now to tell us. So if the leadership and the people of Bugisu subregion agree that you are going to increase on the use of mobile money, you don't cash it out. The moment you get 100,000, you don't run to an agent that give me 100,000. You keep it in your wallet and you, you, know, you keep on making your payments. It will save us the cost of printing cash. And also these thieves, all right, will not be able to waylay you asking for cash. Okay, so there are advantages of not cashing out your mobile money. And that is our appeal to the people of Mbale and the Bugisu region that don't cash out mobile money once you receive it. Try to make payments. I know that the issue of costs and everything, we are going to have a discussion on those costs. I have here somebody who will tell us what we are doing in order to reduce the cost of that. But it's really our plea that you don't cash out once you get mobile money. And then, um, of course, Bank of Uganda also has the authority, even as I talk about mobile money, we also have the authority to issue the national currency 
the notes and the coins that you are holding is Bank of Uganda that has been given the mandate to do it. And the Bank of Uganda upholds what we call a clean note policy. And it does ensure widespread access to money. Now, you've heard of the Mbale currency branch, the Zegulu currency branch, Ginger currency branch, Arua. You know, there are many currency branches. So the purpose of these you know, currency branches is to process cash because some, some of the cash that comes from the public, all right, is not fit to go back into circulation. So they, they identify which one should be canceled, which one should be reissued. They also uh, help in distributing the newly printed currency notes. So it is the aim of Bank of Uganda that once you get cash from Bank of Uganda, it should be clean money. Because we all like clean money. You don't like to have middle-aged money. You, you've been to the market to buy sabulenia, and sometimes you are given a balance of 1,000. You ask yourself, should I or shouldn't I take it? Because the thing is not looking very nice, right? Sometimes you even think, okay, if I take it, I need to go and wash my hands because I don't know how many people have tied this money. So we don't want that kind of situation. We, we want to ensure that the money that you're holding out there is clean. So one of the reasons why we have branches around is to process that currency, to ensure that whatever comes out into circulation is clean. And now you might wonder, but how come that there's a lot of dirty money in, uh, in the public? It's because you have not gone to deposit it in a bank. Because once you deposit money in the bank, it's then the bank that brings that money to Bank of Uganda for processing and for consolation. So we encourage you to keep depositing such, such dirty money so that it's cancelled and new currency is, uh, is issued. But of course also you have to handle the money with care. There is this idea these days, I don't know whether people want to show how rich they are. I am going to, I get this nice looking girl and I'm going for Kwanjula. So I get a flower boutique. I wrap their 50,000 shilling notes, fold them round. And then I go and hand the, the boutique. I think to impress, isn't it? But by so doing, you are destroying the currency. And success cards, you know, kids are sitting PLE. Then you wrap this money round, you know. What are you doing? Are you impressing? Uh, you know, it's... I think we need to, to get off this behavior because it destroys the life, it shortens the life of the currency and that imposes high costs for us. So there are better ways that we can use our money than if you want to impress your girlfriend, why wrap round money? Yes, give her the cash. No? So, Again, we are living in an ever-changing environment. Our mission, therefore, now expands beyond macroeconomic stability to focus on tangible impacts on our actions on people's lives and livelihoods. And that's why we have added into our statement supporting socioeconomic transformation. So we are working to incorporate environmental, social, and governance principles and sustainability within our framework. Colleagues, 70% of our population lives in the rural areas. And the bulk of this population is engaged in agriculture. And that agriculture is rain-fed. And you all know what's happening to rain patterns these days. So it means that the vulnerability of the bulk of our population is becoming higher by the day. We need to ensure, we need to conserve our environment. And that's why Bank of Uganda, in part of supporting social economic transformation, we are focusing so much on environmental, social, and governance. And we're using very, very simple messages on governance. We are telling commercial banks that you know what? We know why you exist. You exist to make profits. But even as you make the profits, you need to be mindful of the people. 
you need to be mindful of the planet in which you're operating. Financial sector sustainability can only be so if the environment in which you are operating is sustainable. So that's the narrative that we're trying to change. So we're trying to institutionalize environment, social, and governance into the supervised financial institutions. We are saying that gone are the days when you are only making profits for your shareholders, when you are creating value for your shareholders. We are now discussing how do we create value for the stakeholders. The stakeholders include those people at the bottom of the pyramid. Those mama mbogas. You know, you go to Nakaloke Market. Those ladies who are selling tomatoes, who are selling uh, uh, sukuma wiki, out of you. How do you bring them on board? How do you ensure that in producing that mboga, in producing that matoke, that the environment under which they are producing it is secure? So we're having a conversation with the, the financial institutions to try to see how we can secure the environment. So we have prioritized integrating ESG, environmental, social, and governance principles and sustainability into the financial sector by focusing, first of all, on raising awareness among financial institutions, establishing robust climate risk policy, and pursuing and promoting sustainability certification. So they are very simple things that we're doing. For example, we want to find out from the commercial banks that in lending, how much money did you lend for things like solar panels, agroforestation, producing more energy-saving stops, charcoal stops, because the ordinary stuff, if you take uh, one month to consume one bag of charcoal, suppose you finance energy-saving stuff, maybe one bag of charcoal can go for three months, those kinds of things. What kind of investments are you putting in place? How are you empowering the youth and the women to produce climate-friendly products? Right? Right now, you have the oil and the gas. This is a hot potato. Everybody wants to lend to oil and gas. But oil and gas in the Alberta region is emitting significant amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And that is going to affect your climate going forward. But remember, this oil and gas is with us for about 20, 25 years, and it's finished. But the environment will still remain with us. So how do we ensure that even as financial institutions are financing oil and gas, we do not destroy the environment that we are going to rely on? So the conversation is that in as much as you are lending this amount of money to the oil and gas, let us see how much you are lending to absorb the carbon that is being injected by the lending. So this is a conversation that we are, we are going to have with them so that we do not destroy our environment at the expense of a resource that is going to be exhausted in a few years' time. But of course, we cannot leave the resource underground. We need to extract that resource for the purpose of propelling our development. And therefore, it means that we need to extract that resource in a manner that preserves our environment. And I think this is what the government is doing, ensuring that, that the, the, the production of oil does not destroy the environment. And therefore, we're encouraging all the financial institutions to do the same, that as you lend, don't, don't destroy the environment. So, um, and of course, we're also developing guidelines together with the banks to seamlessly and safely embed ESG principle and sustainability into their own operations. So I want to believe that we are advocating for establishment of ESG and sustainability principles 
um, within banks, emphasizing the need for collaborative efforts among stakeholders. So even you, the borrowers, you need to be asking yourself that the amount of money I'm borrowing from a bank for the project I want to finance, is it environmentally friendly? Am I going to grow trees? What investment am I going to undertake so that I don't destroy the environment? Because it takes two to tango. You don't expect only the, the commercial banks to be doing this. But even we as the public, we need to be mindful of our environment if we have to ensure that we do not um, risk losing our agricultural potential. So, uh, together, we aim to innovate and devise new strategies to uplift the marginalized communities, bolster industries, and establish policies that are going to promote value creation, particularly among those people at the bottom of the pyramid, so that we are all lifted. And by so doing here, we are talking about financial inclusion. You know, in the olden days, if you didn't have a land title, there was no way you'd get funding from a commercial bank. But thank God that now we have fintechs. You have the likes of Momo. You have AMSUL, A-M-C-U-L, this Airtel. All these applications, they are coming with micro savings micro loans, micro insurance, and they are targeting the bottom of the pyramid. How many of you have received a loan from Momo or from Airtel? A small loan, it could be a, a day or two or a month. Has some of you got a loan? Do you, have, do, you, do you have any savings with them? So this, these fintechs, have been able to reach the bottom of the pyramid. So now, our next step is that if you have these mobile money accounts and you're not cashing out, you are creating a record of how you spend your money. Today I got my money, I went and bought uh, a fertilizer, I went and bought seeds, I went and bought this, I sold my pigs, I got some money here, I sold my chicken, I got my money here, I sold my matoke, I got my money. If it's all on mobile, you are creating a track record of how you use your money. Now, next time you want a loan, you will just tell this company, that, look, this is how I spend my money. You have a track record of how you spend your money. And believe you, believe me, they will lend you money based on how you spent your money if you have been doing it on mobile phone. But if you are this guy who gets money, next time you're in a pork joint, you're in a bar, you are here, you are here, and you're using that, there's no way that you're going to get money. Nobody's going to lend you money, right? So what I'm encouraging you to do is you can empower yourselves by borrowing more money to grow your businesses if you have that track record. You no longer need a collateral, that land title and what have you. Once you have records, once you have records, particularly traceable records, such as in, uh, as in this mobile money, you stand a very high chance of borrowing more money to grow your businesses. So that is how we are going to support the mama board. Today I got my money. I went and bought uh, a fertilizer. I went and bought seeds. I went and bought this. I sold my pigs. I got some money here. I sold my chicken. I got my money here. I sold my matoke. I got my money. If it's all on mobile, you are creating a track record of how you use your money. Now, next time you want a loan, you will just tell this company, that, look, this is how I spend my money. And you have a track record of uh, nearly eight million shares as of September 2020. Now, there's something that we need to note here. Over 60% of the number of its last year have been converted in micro and macro uh, 
on small files under the block allocation arrangement. And this is demonstrate the impact of enhancing financial vision. You know, I looked at this block allocation application forms. It's very, very interesting. And as an example that I made, there were 140 files in Northern England. I think they were going somehow. They came to us with similar things. A hundred and forty things and comments asking for serious problems. On average, how much is each of the data? These two may not last me on the thing like that. Hundred forty million. Asked for by 70 farmers, how much each is each? How much each? Thank you very much. I have to leave you. I have to leave you. Do you know why they were asking for this money? They were trying to buy seeds. They were trying to buy seeds. Seeds. Some of you might have And what's interesting is after six months, they have all been paying this money. But with increased production. With increased production. Now, with that production, they were able to sell to the oil mills in the middle. So if you had like 10 of that groups in this the capacity to produce some power oil would have been increased by 10 fold. Meaning that that oil factor that is doing the processing will have also increased in its own production. And because it's added value, we have had to be oil, we have had so, we have had all animal feeds for things like chicken, and pigs, and cows, and everything. So, this value addition as a result of increased production has a significant impact on the economy. It means that the people that live now would have been able to begin rearing chicken, rearing animals, rearing pigs, and once you do that, Right, the the value the society increases. So this is a very transformative, and that's why we are encouraging the leaders of the society to talk to their people to take to take this decision. If there are any challenges in taking this decision, let's have a discussion on this challenges. So that the people down the road on the end are able to do it. I was in uh, in Texas. We were talking about the value I have two questions. That look, you are taking this million or increasing the new production. You see, the new production, when I just left the university, I was consuming at most. One kind of meal a day, breakfast, because of the bachelor, we have tea for lunch, and then I go to the office, I don't have time to cook, I have my own meal too. And that time I was feeling very mean because of one meal. But since then, the income has increased. I'm not going to get it. That's a mean. That's a mean that I have increased my consumption here. No. So, if anything, the doctors are saying, ah, you may be getting more attention to this on your own. But if you have a value to me, do you want to get really high value to me? I'm going to get the doctors. They do the cheese. They do the cheese. So many doctors. And the people who do consume cheese, the doctors, the names, are not those who do the doctors. Hi, doctors. And you ever have anything in zero? 
Waiting when you can buy cheese. I a DC can buy cheese. They can buy yogurt. They can buy ice cream. These are things which are not consumed by the ordinary people. So value addition tends to produce those products whose consumption increases with higher incomes. And therefore, that means that you can target the local market, you can target the what? The exports. So that's why we are, we are, we are advocating for increased production, for value addition, in order to target export market. And besides, you increase the shelf life. So I am encouraging you to take up SEF loans for increased agricultural production and for agro-processing so that we support the vision of the country of value addition and we get more exports and more incomes. Likewise for the SPRF. This SBRF was set to help those farms, micro, small, medium enterprises that were badly hit by COVID and they cannot recover. I was looking at an application. There was a lady who, whose saloon had been affected because of the lockdown. So her business was not thriving. She came to ask for a loan. She wanted to buy these things. What do you call the, you know, these things, the balloons you put on the, on the hair. Uh, uh, no, no, there's a glass thing. I don't know the hair. Me, me, I call them balloons, you know, something that you put there. So she wanted to buy those things to revive her business. And indeed she, she did. All right? So right now, our strategy in the, in the bank is to increase the uptake of this. Now, um, so given the agricultural dominance of the Bugisu subregion and Mbale city, the Bank of Uganda is urging the Mbale leaders to champion agricultural modernization and value addition projects. This transformation, in our view, will uplift the communities from subsistence farming to a thriving commercial economy. This is what we call socioeconomic transformation. So we encourage the Mbale agricultural stakeholders to utilize SEF and SBRF to finance value-adding projects. The block allocation that I talked about, arrangement under the SEF, caters for those small farmers who have no collateral, and it accepts things like the movable property, inventories, and even credit history that we talked about. So we administer these two funds and demonstrates our commitment to fostering agricultural and small businesses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to end by making a plea that addressing climate change is crucial, particularly in the Bank of Uganda's role. Climate change, uh, like altered rainfalls, flooding, race, rising temperatures, they significantly impact Uganda's agriculture, water resources, and public health. The vulnerability of the Bugisu subregion, reliant on agriculture, is evident through the recurring landslides in Bududa, severely affecting the livelihoods, lives, and the limb. It's also a threat to food security, price shocks, and welfare due to climate change. This is, these are all pressing issues. We therefore call for action, very, very immediate action by the district leadership. This is needed. It was needed yesterday. Supporting initiatives such as reforestation, developing drought-resistant crops, and enhancing water management practices is essential to mitigate and adapt these impacts. Now, for us on Bank of Uganda, we are advancing ESG and through our corporate social responsibility, initiatives to offer accessible and high quality health care.
in November 2020, and this agenda was advanced in that context. This commitment aligns with the vital role of healthcare services as a cornerstone to the national socioeconomic transformation. So let me pause here to highlight the Bank of Uganda's emphasis on multi-stakeholder engagement, which echoes the words I said earlier on of Mary Therese Winfred Robinson believe in collective problem solving. The public's recent challenges in accessing government transformative parish development model funds from financial institutions, these demand immediate actions because we understand that people have been queuing, some have been sleeping on the streets to access these funds. So these demand actions and maybe we'll hear from the financial institutions here what needs to be done. So reports of excessive queues forcing beneficiaries to sleep on the streets and exposing them to theft are alarming. We therefore urge commercial banks to bolster their capacity to guarantee timely and dignified access to financial services uh, with more staff and using mobile money and IT platforms. For example, the post bank came with a platform called Wendy to disburse the PDM funds. Now, I want to end here and I want to turn now to the questions and the answer session. I've talked a lot, I've given so many examples. So I want all of you to feel free to ask us anything about Bank of Uganda and our mandate. And I want to thank you for your very, very kind attention and patience to my long presentation. And may God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor. Uh, in the English we use here, we say Wanyana Nabi Papa. That is the English here in, in the Bugisu. So Wanyana Nabi, Haliku Monge, Retinda is an age, you think. Wanyanabi. We shall be turning to the question and answer session very shortly, but allow me uh, recognizing our midist the Member of Parliament for Bungoko North, Honorable Dr. John Faith Magoro, who joined us. Honorable, thank you for joining us for, for this session. In our midst, we also have the Speaker of Mali City, Honorable Nambuya Maria. Thank you for joining us. We have the Deputy RCC, Valley City, Northern Division, Mr. Wayne Yahaya, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have the representative of the Women Member of Parliament of Valley District, uh, Mr. Mafuma Naidu. Thank you for joining us. And then the District Commercial Office Ambale, Mr. Bun uh, Madam Bunoti Irene Shimiyu. Thank you for joining us. The district planner, Mr. Magomu Abdallah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the DISO, Mbale District, Mr. Carlo Godfrey. Thank you for joining us. Yes, I think... Uh, that's it for, for our leaders. And in our midst, we have Centenary Bank representatives. If you're here, please raise up. Thank you. At least I, from yesterday's, he's the area manager from, for Centenary Bank here in Bali. We have uh, DFCU. Thank you. We have Housing Finance Bank. We have Finance Trust Bank. Thank you. We have Diamond Trust Bank, DTB. Thank you for joining us. We have Stanbic Bank. Ah, thank you. We have Post Bank. Yes, Post Bank has been with us since yesterday. Uh, we have Bank of Africa. Bank of Africa. Okay, 
they are still in Africa, they will come to Bali later. We have uh, KCB Bank. KCB is there. And we have uh, Pride Microfinance. Oh, thank you for joining us. We have Yuga Ford. Thank you. Uh, Moses, come and collect for me this one. The, the handwriting went to the doctors. I, this one here. Hmm? Oh, this is Duck Hill. Duck Hill. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, in security circles, we have this so resource. The sources are so many. So we have the CISO. Uh, CISO, City Internal Security Officer, Madam Cherangat Dorothy. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, we have the RDC Mbali. My Asmin Naski. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, we are going into the question and answer session, but uh, the deputy governor whispered to me that the weather has changed, so I think we need a little bit of warmth. So he has prepared a, a cup of tea, but we shall use the next 10 minutes. Okay, we, we shall pick it and have a working tea here. Okay? Yes, so the, somebody will come to you, raise you up, wait until that person comes, go pick a cup of tea, come, and we continue with the session, with the questions. So I want to request my team, please take your positions, and let's do this as fast as possible. If you can take the high table first, as we continue with the questions. I also want to appeal to you that in your in the documents you found on the table on the on the chair there are registration forms please